You're watching Cycle Talk, Australia's motorcycle show. From sports bikes to motocross to cruisers, we love them all. We ride them, thrash them, test them, and sometimes we even crash them. On this episode, Ryan rides the new Kawasaki Z650, Chris buys an MT10, Nigel checks out Locks and Sunnies, and Custom Talk is back with an XJR 1300. Now, do you remember this stuff? Two-stroke oil. It's almost a thing of the past these days, although there are still a few enduro bikes out there that are two-stroke powered. But KDM has announced that it's developed a new engine using computer controls, and most importantly, fuel injection, a transfer port injected two-stroke engine that meets all the new Euro 4 emission laws and noise laws. And this will be produced in limited numbers in 250cc and 300cc capacities for both KDM and Husqvarna branded machines in the 2018 model year. Now, this is really, really interesting because these new bikes will still be lighter than the equivalent four strokes, but they should have a better spread of power than any two stroke before it, and possibly a better spread of power than the four strokes. They'll also be lighter um, and potentially um, easier to ride, faster, and more competitive than an equivalent four stroke. Unfortunately, being a little bit simpler isn't necessarily gonna mean much cheaper because KDM spent about five years trying to develop these new bikes and that development has to be paid for somewhere. So expect to pay around about the same price as a current uh, four-stroke enduro machine. The other thing that they haven't mentioned that I think could be really, really interesting is developing some road bikes using these engines. Two-stroke powered sports bikes were definitely the go back in the day about 20, 30 years ago. And who knows, KTM could bring these back and own that marketplace as well which would be really, really exciting. Legendary racer John Surtees passed away in March. He was the only man to have won motorcycle Grand Prix titles and a Formula One title. He won seven motorcycle titles and, and 350 and 500ccs in the 1950s and early 60s. And then in 1964, won the Formula One championship with Ferrari. Most of his wins were on Italian machinery, MV Augusta and Ferrari. Surtees was both a gentleman and also a driven individual. Highly passionate about winning and, and doing the best he possibly could. He was very, very much a racer's racer. He was 83 when he passed away and at that stage he was the oldest F1 champion still alive. 2017 is proving to be a pretty good year for new motorcycles. And there's four in particular that I reckon are pretty interesting. So the Ducati Super Sport. Now here's a, a machine that's still a Ducati sports bike, still looks like a Ducati sports bike, still got the full fairing that uh, these bikes are known for, but it's got a much more relaxed riding position than the full on hyper sports machines like the Panigale. The Super Sport should offer 90% of the performance of a Panigale, but at a much reduced price with a lot more versatility. And in fact, some of the shots from Ducati even show the bike with two people on it. A Ducati sports bike that can carry two people in comfort, that's a bike we're keen to ride. We really like riding around racetracks when we get a chance. And for 2017, Yamaha's got a new R6. And if we get the opportunity to ride one of these on a circuit, we'll be there with our leathers on faster than you can say tuning forks. This bike's got all the fruit, traction control and uh, aluminium tank, whole bunch of fancy electronics built into a 600 Super Sport. This could be more fun than anything since they released the R1 a couple of years ago. BMW's announced the R1200 GS Rally, developed in conjunction with BMW Australia. And this is going to be the most off-road focused 1200 GS ever. Probably the most off-road focused GS ever. It's gonna have longer travel suspension, stiffer suspension, uh, more ground clearance, cross-spoke wheels, uh, knobby tires, Lots of fruit to make riding through the Australian bush that much better. G we always like the GSs, this one should be the best ever. From out of left field has come the Triumph Bobber. Now this is a really unusual machine that I certainly didn't see coming. But it's a parallel twin uh, air-cooled engine. It's got a single seat that's a saddle style. It looks like an old bike 
that's been restored and customised straight out of the crate. And, and I think this could be a, a lot of fun. I don't think it'll handle, I don't think it'll go, I don't think it'll stop, but it doesn't need to do any of those because it looks fantastic for the sort of writing it's designed for and for getting the conversation started. I wanna have a go on a Triumph Bobber. And now for some bikes we'll probably never ever get a chance to ride. The first one is the XADV Adventure Scooter from Honda. Now, the whole idea of taking a scooter off-road fills me with horror. The whole idea of of going adventure bike riding on something with relatively small wheels is just is just doesn't bear thinking about. But this thing uh, does seem to be pretty exciting. Now, Honda said they're not bringing it into Australia, but they said that about the Grom too, and we started getting those. So, with any luck, we'll get a chance to have a go on a bike that should be stupidity itself, a scooter in the dirt. The Norton V4, 28,000 pounds. Yeah, nah. No, that's way too much money. Here's a really interesting thing though. I mean, the Norton's been reborn. Um, we've had a go on the uh, Norton uh, Parallel Twin. A lot of fun, interesting machine. And the V4 is a British attempt at building something that's really exclusive and really interesting and really fast. And they've been racing them around the uh, Isle of Man and that's all really exciting, but 28,000 uh, pounds, that's just way too much money and I doubt if I'll ever get a chance to ride one, but I hope I do. Okay, I have to read this. The Husqvarna Vitpillen or Zvartbillen. Yeah, because I struggle to remember those. But their new single cylinder uh, commuter bikes, really, um, there should be nothing really special about them. And I, we are gonna get them in this country and Cycle Talk, hopefully we'll get a chance to ride them. But they look so radical. And I really wonder if people will uh, be attracted to them, whether dealers will want to stock them and whether the people out there will buy them. Their marketing material says they started with a blank sheet and tried to come, come up with a new bike for road use that was as minimalistic as possible with obviously with a sense of style and a sense of Husqvarna. So I'm really keen to throw a leg over these bikes, although I really wonder if, uh, if they'll disappear into, into history in the future because they were too radical for their time. I hope not. Somebody said to me recently they'd give their left nut to ride the new Fireblade 1000 SP. I wouldn't, and the reason why is I reckon I'll need both of them heading down the main straight at Phillip Island, going into turn one at, at close to 300 kilometers an hour on what looks like a very, very trick motorcycle. In the history of Honda with the RC30, the RC45, I wonder if this new uh, Fireblade will fit into that category. Chances are I'll never get a chance to ride one, but again, I would, uh, I would be there with bells on, given the opportunity. This bike test is brought to you by Avon Tyres. Kawasaki has updated its 650 learners in 2017, and with just a few simple refinements, it has really made a pair of cracker quackers. Today, we're going to take a look at the Z650L. The 2017 Z replaces the ER6NL and the changes really bring the bike into line with the Z family. And at first look, you might not think so. The Z650 has traditionally been an inline four, where this engine is a parallel twin. And the modern Z styling is still there, but not completely. Traditionalists may think, how dare they destroy the sanctity of Z? But realistically, the modern interpretation is designed for people just starting out or coming back. So the changes with the lightweight trellis frame and an engine with increased low to mid-range performance really make sense. All up, the Z650 weighs about 14 kilos less than the ER6 NL that it replaces. Kawasaki has shed most of it with the new frame and almost as importantly, they've also reduced unsprung weight from the wheels, the front axle and the swing arm, which should improve handling. And while that engine remains largely the same, the Z650L produces slightly less power, but slightly more torque compared to the previous model. And Kawasaki's redesigned the airbox, throttle bodies, injectors, intake and exhaust cams and intake ports, all to increase low to mid response. The changes make the bike much easier to ride and safer too. It gets off the line easier and is much more forgiving if you're in too high a gear. And Kawasaki has also got you covered with a slipper clutch, which works when you change to too low a gear. 
so it prevents the rear wheel from locking up. And if you think you've heard most of this before, you're right. The Ninja and Z650s are very similar and that's because they share the same platform. So there are a few steering geometry changes between the bikes. The steering geometry on the Z650 is slightly sharper than the Ninja, but I think only seasoned pros will notice the difference. And there's no mistaking that this Z650 is part of the Z family. The upswept seat may not have the Z pattern like the iconic Z1000, but it does share that imposing aura Kawasaki dubs Sugomi. In 2017, we see a Z pattern LED tail light and sophisticated instrumentation, which has a digital taco, which doubles as a shift light. There's also a gear position indicator, which is a great learner friendly feature, as well as the usual suspects, odometer, dual trip meters, fuel range, current and average fuel range, current and average fuel consumption, external temperature, coolant temperature, a clock, and the economical riding indicator, which tells you when you're riding like an old granny, but you're getting good fuel consumption. The other big point of difference in the styling is the offset rear shock has been replaced with a linkage unit. The test unit we received is in metallic flat spark black, and there is also a pearl flat white version available too. As a daily ride, the Z650L makes a great commuter and all-round fun bike to ride. Same as the Ninja. Kawasaki deserves high praise for the engine changes and weight reduction. The bike gets off the line with ease, will get you out in front of traffic and is happy to sit at those city speeds in a high gear. The upright riding position is certainly a factor here too. A low seat height and easy reach to the bars will suit most. The riding position is ever so slightly forward and into the wind and it allows the rider to feel in control without putting too much pressure on your wrists. When it comes to stopping the bike, two 300mm discs are up front with two piston calipers, and they're there to pull you up on a dime. ABS is standard, and the initial bite's strong, and the feedback's good through the levers. The suspension's also pretty well set up for daily riding too. It's not too firm, and it's not too plush. It is pretty basic kit though, so you're gonna have to set the rear preload, which is basically for rider weight. When the speeds increase to that 80 to 90 km an hour mark, there's no need to bang down a gear or two. The Z will pull away, but not too far. The engine changes and shorter gearing will give the bike a tendency to sign off a touch earlier. The Z will handle those freeway speeds too, although wind buffeting may start to become a problem. If you spend a lot of time on the open road, the Ninja might be the better pick for you. Some vibrations also creep in around that 5,000 rev mark, which isn't so much of a problem at those everyday speeds. But at the freeway limit, the ride can become a bit tingly. It's not a huge complaint, but something Kawasaki might want to look at to improve the bike in future. I got the chance to push this bike pretty hard, and tipping the bike over from side to side provides a great experience of what motorcycling is all about. Z650L is great in that sense, because you don't have to go out and buy a bigger machine once you're off your L plates. So I've spent a few weeks with the bike, and I think it's a great middleweight option. It's a great learner bike, it'll be great for commuters, and great for returner riders too. It's got a list of features that's as good as it is long. Prices start from $9,699 plus on roads. Go and check one out at your local Kawasaki dealer. After the break, Chris buys an MT-10, custom talk, and lots more. This product review is brought to you by Avon Tyres. Today, we're bringing you a look at Covex Alarm Locks. So this one here, is the, let me see, it's the KAL6. Now the six means it's got a six millimeter pin there and the alarm in it, 120 decibels, um, and that's just alarm. So in a few seconds when I can't hold this steady enough, it'll start to um, make some funny noises and then it's gonna go off and wreck my ears. So there's a good look at one. There's the beeping it makes and it'll go off in a second. Oh, there it goes there. So, I'll turn the key and that comes off. Now it comes with three keys, which I really, really like. And it also comes 
with, um, with a long life battery. So the battery will last for years and years and years. And uh, it looks like they're built really, really strong. And you'll pay about $72.50 for those. Now, I think that's really good value. I would also invest in one of these. It's a $5 extra but you run this from your lock to your handlebars and you never forget that you've actually got an alarm uh, fitted. Um, so they're in four colors. So you've got the orange, orange, this chrome one, which is my personal favorite. You've got the black and yellow and the yellow and black. Makes a lot of sense. Now, they're great for, for when you park the bike to another place to, you wanna make sure you can keep your bike is by locking it to something. And with an alarm, it'll be uh, even more secure. So this Covex cable alarm, they're over a metre long. That's locked up. So over a metre long, you can lock your bike to something solid that's immovable. And uh, you'll have that much more chance of making sure the bike is still there when you get back. So you thicken it up like this, turn that, it locks and you've got a few seconds to, to go away before it'll go off. There, it's all set, 120 decibels again. Um, so that'll knock your socks off if it, uh, if it decides to go off. If somebody tries to move it, cut it, steal your bike, uh, it'll go off and make a horrible noise, which hopefully will get you running to your bike and to see who's trying to steal it. So this one is 100 is only $79.95 and it comes with a rechargeable battery in it. It comes with a USB cable to recharge it. I think that's an absolute bargain. I think that's uh, definitely the go. And I really don't want to oh, hear that. There we go. Covex, more, more information from proaccessories.com.au. This bike test is brought to you by Spitty on track. Where's Graham? Oh no, it's Pico. <laughs> Hello Graham. Hey Chris, how can I assist you? Well mate, I'm in a buy bike, motorbike. That's what you said last time. Yeah, well I'm serious this time. So uh, I've got a bike in mind, but what do you reckon? Mate, I, I think this R15 has got just the horsepower you need. Look, I'm 50, but I'm not 50 and worn out. So turn around, that's the bike behind you I'm interested in. Ah, the Yamaha MT10. That's the one. Aha, ah, perfect, you'll love it. Well, sell it to me. Well, you know it's got the R1 crossplane crank, so the motor's absolutely great. You'll love this dash. Look, shut up, I'm sold. Just take my money. Well, Yamaha motor finances money. Okay, follow me. Okay, Chris, would you like some accessories with that? Well, now that you mentioned it, yeah, I'll have one of them uh, Acropovic slip-on mufflers. Yep. A tall screen. Yep. Handlebar risers. Yep. A touring tank bag. Yep. And uh, one of them fat little footprint things that you put under your side stand. I don't want my bike falling over. Not a problem, mate. Well, Chris, your finances have approved. You're not that much of a risk. Beautiful. Well, mate, mine a black one. How's that flat tracker project of mine going? Like I said, make it black. It's time for me to tell you about my Yamaha MT10. Now, I only bought this a week and a half ago. Uh, they're, they're basically $18,000 plus on road. And I reckon it's a bargain. Now, what, what do I like about it? Why buy one of these when I can get access to loads of different bikes? I've been riding different bikes for years. A lot of great bikes. But this is a bike that made me put my hand into my own pocket. And it's a keeper, I reckon. Now, People have accused me of not liking technology, and that's not true. But as I have to say, if you've got 15 or 16 settings for traction and control, I mean, come on, that's just over the top. This has got three. Three rider modes, three traction control settings. They all work, you can turn it off. It's got ABS, fly-by-wire, all sort of carry-on. Now, they're basically, people have been wanting this bike for years. Ever since the cross-plane crankshaft came out with the Yamaha R1 in about 2008, why haven't Yamaha built one, a naked bike with that engine? Well, finally, they, they got a lick of sense about them and they've done it. And when I rode this thing at the Australian launch last year, I, I fell in love with it. I just couldn't believe how good a bike this was. It's got the cross-plane crankshaft from the new R1 in it, 
fantastic engines have been retuned, so it hasn't got as much horsepower as the R1, but it's got 150 or something like, how much do you need? Um, it's got the suspension from the R1 with softer settings, and I've played with it a bit more since then, I've, I've softened it a little bit more, so it's halfway between, um, you know, our standard and, uh, and soft, and I've even got the owner's manual out, which is the first for me, so I sorted all that out. I've put a few accessories on it, I've got some more to go, which we're gonna look at that in a later episode, but, I've got to tell you, I absolutely love this bike. There's one thing I can say that I don't like about it, and that's the hard seat. But I've got that sorted because I've got a, um, a factory comfort seat coming. So uh, the old backside will get a bit of a softer time. Join us next week when Pico christens his new MT-10 by going naked touring with the boys for three days scratching on the Oxley Highway and its surrounds. green as, but you can see down there uh, where the fires rage through. And, uh... This product review is brought to you by Kabuto Helmets. This product review is brought to you by Eyes Wide Open from motobooks.com.au. Yeah, there's one thing in life you should always remember. You've got to use protection. And what I'm talking about is eye protection. And we've been using Wiley X sunglasses here at Cycle Talk for many, many years. Because as a sportswear sunglass manufacturer, they've specifically gone out and designed sunnies that are particularly suited to motorcyclists. And they've done such a good job that you now have these co branded Harley Davidson Wiley X sunnies that you can get. So there's a range of those as well. In the standard Wiley Xs, there's a whole range of normal conventional sunnies, but there's also these particular styles called the Climate Control Series that look like conventional sunnies, but they have in the back a seal. And this rubber seal is designed to keep out the dirt, the dust and the, and the rubbish and the wind, um, which is very easy to pull out and you don't have to use it when you're just using a normal pair of sunnies. But when you're on the bike, you just pop that in just takes a few seconds to pop into place. And you've got a, a sunglass that blocks out the, uh, that wind and dust. And your eyes remain safe. Fits under a helmet really, really well. There's about 14 different models available too, so you, and a whole bunch of different colours. So you, you, you can choose the ones that you like, and then they become highly protective. They've got very, very tough lenses and frames in the Wiley X's. Uh, sunglasses to give you the protection from the UV that you need and things like gravel and dust and dirt and of course if you've got that comfort seal the wind as well. So really really well designed uh, sunglasses for motorcyclists and not only that you can even get prescription ones so I use a prprescription to correct my vision on a motorcycle and so these particular pair these gravity ones are going off to goggle man um, and they're going to make up a set of equally tough prescription lenses to suit me. They'll be back in a couple of weeks and I'll give a report on them after they've been here for a little while. If you're like me, you love custom bikes and you love making them different, making them yours. So when the purists tell you, you can't do that, it's the wrong style, ignore them. Build it, ride it and love it. What stirs the passion with me with this bike would have to be just how smooth it is to ride. Hopping on it, you just feel like you're in another world. The power's there. I know that I can go from the lights to the next set of lights across the intersection as fast as I possibly could. With the design of the bike, I started just compiling a lot of images because I'm an illustrator, I use Photoshop. I mocked everything up change different seats, different paint jobs, different forks, either upside down or normal. And we came to a conclusion, well I came to a conclusion, and it was agreed upon with Harley at RB Racing that this would work. It would look mean and aggressive 
and we went for it. Once the image was done, we tweaked it a little bit more. There was a belly pan involved at one point, but we decided the pipes are too nice. So I started with BMX and mountain bikes. I was starting to get too old, in my mid-30s. So I sold them with a 30-year-old comic book collection. That got me an SR500, which I started with as a learner's. I got towards the end of my restrictions and I decided I'm going to start building something that I want to keep. So the 15 on the back of the bike was the year my daughter was born. Um, that's just one thing that I can take with me wherever I go, you know, she's always by my side. Getting rid of the comic books wasn't a big decision and I still don't regret it at one, one little second. Dave sacrificed a whole lifetime of his collection of comic books to make his dream come true. But the big question is, what would you sacrifice to make your custom dream come true?